You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Releasing my pain, I never let the rage out until I was until I got into the film business in Hollywood and had been out of combat for two years. It came out because I was drinking and doing and drugging so hard, it started coming out. Uh, my wife, uh, the reason why I left my wife is because she was having an affair. The bullets going like this with the RPG flying right behind my head, hit him. And then when I put my weapon up, I freaking put two right in his chest. And my heavy gun happens to be off its T and E, so he can free gun and my fucking gunner can lay on that trigger and destroy that vehicle and kill three more. And you're dealing with death all the time and, and seeing wives fucking crying and children crying and little babies in the arms. It's very fucking serious. It's very serious, but if you think back, James, was this any di- If we were back 2,000 years ago, it'd still be the, it would be the same. When I hit this terrorist network and I got their fucking data, and we watched what they were doing and we saw them taking people, saw, sawing people's heads off. I mean, it filled me with such hate and rage and absolutely resolved to fucking kill every single fucking one of them. And of course, you know what? If he was ever face to face with me, he wouldn't say a thing. He'd have no chance, not against me. <laughs> Believe that. And that I used to be a hero and books have been written about what I did in combat and I have gold medals uh, fighting the best in the world. And, and yet, here I am with nothing that matters. And brother, when I put that gun in my mouth, Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got badass Rudy Reyes. How are you, brother? I'm doing fantastic, brother. I'm very, very thankful and honored to be on here, my man. Yeah, it's good to have you on. You're, you're, you're worth doing some amazing work. You've done some phenomenal things in your life. You're one of the toughest men out there. Like, you're, are you a sergeant as well, Rudy? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. You know what, brother? It's so interesting. We got... Um, we had some some people here. I'm out on task right now. I can't say where, uh, with the lads, with the freaking best. And uh, we had some new uh, new cat come to the team. Um, they were talking to Foxy, and Foxy's like, "Man, he's fucking crazy, or he's a nutter at all this." And he goes, "But he's a tough cunt." <laughs> <laughs> what a compliment! What a compliment! What a compliment! You know? Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into all the mad stuff, brother, I always go back to the sure, start brother. with my guests. Where, where you grew up? And yes, sir. How it all began? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, um, I I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, which is in the center of our big country. Um, we had an air base there. My father was back and forth between Vietnam. My mother was very young. My father was young. I think my father was 23. My mother was 17. And um, so uh, in America, if you are in the military, you ha- you can have medical care at, at our hospitals, at any hospital across the country, which we have a lot of for our Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and Air Force. So I was born in Kansas City because my mother was uh, come uh, drove to Kansas City. My family's all from South Texas. We're Mexican-American and Mexican. Um, my biological father is actually a Mexican citizen, although he looks as European as myself, right? Spanish. Uh, she was there to see her mother. And, uh, and then, and then I was coming out, my man, and I was coming out, brother. I was like, I think two months premature. So I was born in Kansas city, but I grew up in the beginning of my life on the border of, of Texas and Mexico down South. How was, how was schooling and stuff there? Uh, you know what, bro? Um, it was third world still back then. Uh, we had a, we didn't have a pay, paved roads in the poor area that we lived where my family was from. We're all migrant workers. Uh, my family and myself uh, as well. We picked uh, crops and we worked uh, in the fields. Um, we had an outhouse, outhouse, uh, no plumbing, and uh, we had electricity. But one of our out, uh, our out, outer retaining walls or, or you know outer walls was missing. And it, it's kind of tropical down there. It's very hot. Yeah, yeah, you folks up in the UK, it's 
it's like going to the Caribbean. That's the temperate area of it. Uh, you know, that's the kind of climate of it. And um, I, lo I, I love playing with frogs and playing playing in the canal and, and you know, uh, the, the toys that we had. Um, we, we would play with marbles, which we call canicas in Spanish. We would play with jacks. And then we had something called trompos, which are wooden tops. And you wrap them with string. And I remember learning. And, and when I felt like such a big boy, when I learned at about four, to wind the top and have the manipulation of my fingers and then spin it. So it was a very simple. It's probably like a lot of them, a lot of the world, a lot of the third world. Um, and then I, I got to the Midwest by around five or six public school. But, uh, but because we were poor and my mother uh, had left my father, we were on welfare. We had the ability to go to a nice school with, with more white people and safer neighborhood, uh, safer neighborhoods and white people. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And I had, in, I had incredible schooling till about second grade kindergarten to second grade incredible i would say since i went to 20 different schools as a orphan and and moved around the whole country i would say the strength of those first three years of education to include preschool is what allowed me to graduate high school learning my figures learning my reading and writing learning how to read and uh, enunciate and pronounce words and comprehension up to second grade that's what's carried me probably all the way till now yeah. How does that affect you being in so many different schools, not really feeling as if you had a home? Like, does that confuse you as a boy or does it just be kind of come the norm? You know, brother, I was thinking about these things, you know, before coming on here and I, I did some research and I watch your, watch your podcast and I, and I love your fitness journey, brother. I'm very proud of you and I'm sure we'll get into Thank that you. later. Uh, yeah, very proud of you, bro. Um, no, it was very difficult. It was uh, very cruel, very hard. Um in poor neighborhoods, um, there's a Bible and law mentality. There's a scarcity mindset. There's a predatory energy. And I'm the oldest brother. So, uh, no, I, I, I had to experience firsthand extreme cruelty, extreme violence. And, um, and that's not – okay, let me say this. I, I imagine I am a very empathetic person, naturally, my genetics, my, the kind of person I am, I'm an empathetic person. I am an uh, um, imaginative person. Those kinds of things are crushed in the ghetto. Those kinds of things are crushed in the orphanage. Um, unless, unless um, James, you learn to be strong. You start lifting weights and you start boxing and wrestling and you start getting the courage after you get beat up to get back up and fight. That's the only way a, uh, a benevolent person can survive in those conditions. And so that's what I had to do. At first, you know, I cried a lot. I cried a lot. I said, you know, why, did, why are people so hor horrible? And, you know, the, the older boys beating you up and then you know you get a little you get to a stage and you know you have people trying to um to rape you and i mean it's it's hardcore out there man it is no joke um nature shows us this and there's a child or a, or a female some some weak uh, physically smaller weaker life form if there is a not a, not a protect a protective uh, uh, um, pack or tribe around it, it will be predated upon. And the human race is no different. And, you know, looking back, though, it really made me face the truth of human existence and, the, and, and all existence very quickly. If you are not strong and cannot fight and therefore threaten someone that is trying to dominate you, then you will be dominated. And if you're dominated, then um, then you will die. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's the same mentality for being in the military to being outside the military? It's kind of a killer be killed mentality. It's survival mode. I think maybe that's possibly why I love the Marine Corps so much. It, it, it felt very honest to me. Um, and 
Yes. Uh, yet within, when you make it through selection, when you become a recon marine, and for for the, uh, my UK audience out there that doesn't know about reconnaissance community, the amphibious reconnaissance, we are like your SBS. Um, the Marine Corps, the smallest of our militaries, which is, I know you guys are going to be like, what the fuck? It's 300,000, 300,000 Marines, all is riflemen. Of that, only 300 men like me. So we have to go through an extreme selection. Um, when you finally make it to the platoon, when you finally freaking show that you're worth it, I've never had more love in my life than those brothers loving and respecting and protecting me. Um, uh, it, it, it was honest. It was truthful. It was direct. It was not clouded by any opinions. Do you win the battle? Are you number one? or not. And I could definitely understand that. Is that the first time you felt it was if you had a family to do? Oh, the best family in the world. I still got them. I mean, look, it's such a profound quantum family. I got Billy and Foxy as my family too. I mean, we fought in the same wars. We fought in the same battle space. Me and Billy fought the same fucking AOs on same ops, doing different things on the same op. Know the same people. Um, and I got a family, like, you know, I just started working with these brothers a year, a year and a half ago. That's the family. What a family it is. And it has me reflect, too, um, uh, why, why I'm still – now I'm more emotional and sensitive, I think, now more than ever because I have the confidence. I have such confidence that I'm not concerned about what people think of me. Um, September 11th is very hard on me. And um, – and September 11th is extreme. You know, I fought. Uh, I was on the ship when the towers were hit. And, and uh, if you UK audience uh, don't know much about my culture over here, but our sailors, a lot of them come out of New York City. And they're black. Uh, a lot of our military people are poor white trash, black, Latino, and an incredibly freaking rising Asian community, right? Um, if you got college and... and a, and, uh, and you've had it uh, in any way protected or easy, you normally don't join the military unless you have a drive inside and maybe a lineage of glory and honor. So a lot of the sailors and being a sailor is one of the hardest jobs in the world. No glory, all hard work. All right. Seeing these black brothers, my, my black brothers in Dominican and Puerto Rican brothers from New York City as I'm on the mess deck and I'm drawing tattoos. I'm an illustrator, and I'm drawing tattoos for the infantrymen when he, we eventually get to the uh, to Thailand to get tattoos, so that I can make ten dollars here, ten dollars there, to call my wife at the time on the phone from the ship. The towers are being hit. I can't quite connect it. It's my home because I, it's so far removed. I think it must be Tel Aviv. It must be a movie. It must be Jerusalem. The sirens are going off. And then I'm hearing, I'm looking across the mess deck with, with the people in the kitchen. My black brother's crying and screaming, Dominican screaming. And, 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 and somebody holding one of my brothers, holding another brother like that, screaming. And it's saying, recon, um, seal platoon, report to your birthing. So it's recon marines and seals report to their birthing to get their orders. Seemed like it lasted an hour. It was probably only three seconds to me. It lasts an eternity, still lasts an eternity. And now it's 21 years later, and I remember it like it was yesterday. So that's what I'm going through right now. And then the day before, you know, our beloved queen passed away. And my brothers were down, you know, I'm down. Because I've been, you know, I, I've been fighting with my, my community from the UK in war. I am working with them now in peace. I've traveled the world and fought in the worst place in, places in the world. I have the most beautiful people from the third world that I go to do counter terror and, and, and help them rise so that they become educated and literate so that they can repel the terrorists themselves and have um, self-determination. And, and I know some of these truthful things. I may not be very eloquent or articulate. I have no college, but I know what's truthful. And I've just been going through the last three days. It's been really freaking hard. You know what I'm saying? For me. Yeah. Proud of you for keep going though, brother. Like you're doing amazing work. Thanks, Rob. See after, see after okay. schooling, Rudy, like, what was your plans? Was it to join the Marines straight away or were you just kind of a lost soul at that time? Mm, well, um, 
I'm a painter. I'm an illustrator. And, um, and I uh, received a painting scholarship to a really prestigious private art uh, college um, when I got out of the boys' home when I was 18. And, uh, but I have two little brothers, and I could, um, I, I could not bring them with me to the barracks, to the dorms. And so I had to forego the college. And it's a prestigious art college. And I was, I'm a very good painter. Uh, all the while, wrestling wrestling, lifting weights. And then when I could not go to art college, I immersed myself in kickboxing. And then ultimately it led me to the China's national team. I trained Shaolin Kung Fu. I fought all over the country internationally, beat the Russians, beat the freaking Chinese, beat anybody in front of me because I trained harder because I never, I, and I never drank alcohol. I never smoked a cigarette um, because I had that discipline from having a hard life. Uh, and I was afraid of the military. You know, I couldn't imagine carrying a gun or killing somebody exactly. I couldn't imagine killing somebody. I didn't have the hard heart to kill. However, when I saw Kosovo, I saw a documentary about orphans in Kosovo. And then there was uh, on, the, on the USA Today, President Clinton is putting Americans on the ground. They said, I'm fucking fighting. I'm fucking going. I'm going to go fight for those kids. I'm, I'm not going to let anybody stand in my way. Plus, there's inside, I think, every every man. I think every man. Or at least every man I know. But then again, the men I know are all guys like me. <laughs> Crazy um, bastards. We all, yeah, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> we, we, uh, <laughs> we, we all want to, we all wonder, like, how, how will we perform when the chips are down and the rounds are coming in or if we're wounded or a loved one's wounded or when every, when the, when the house is on fire, when the building's on fire, how will we, how will we act? Will we um, collapse or will we rise? And, um, and I knew that by joining the Marine Corps as an infantryman that I'm surrendering to the process. I'm surrendering to it. I'm no longer an individual. I'm surrendering. And uh, I think, um, well, I don't, I, I observe that God has a plan for me. Um, I'll fast forward really quick. After three continuous wars, two invasions, two expeditionary open-ended warfare cycles in which I came back over a year. Uh, it wasn't until I came back home. And two of those wars, I, it was top secret uh, uh, TSSCI. Uh, no, my my wife at the time had no contact. My family had no contact with me except every month an email by an official saying I'm still alive. Um, and then I fought in Fallujah and Ramadi, the fucking heaviest bloodbath anybody can imagine uh, in the last in really since the last 50, 60, last fifty years since freaking um, um, Tet offensive and. Uh, and since fighting in Vietnam or fighting maybe in Congo, actually, no, because they're not big enough. They didn't have enough fighters. I, I fought in Fallujah and Ramadi. It's, you know, fucking heavy, man. The fucking heaviest yeah. you can imagine. And um, I came back and I saw my Kung Fu teacher, Chun Man Sit, went to Kansas City to see Chun Man Sit from, from China. He calls me Ludi, Ludi. He can't say Rudy. He can say Ludi. <laughs> Ludi. I say, I say, uh, and, you know, I don't give a shit if anybody out there is like, hey, he's fucking, I don't care what anybody says about me, brother. I don't. Um, so um, I said, uh, Sifu, Sifu, were you, were you scared? Because I was his number one student. Oh, and he, I was his number one student. And I won all those gold medals and such. And uh, I said, were you scared I wasn't coming back? And, you know, I thought about your teachings all the time. And I trained all the time in the field, even when I was fighting. And he goes, Ludi, uh, it is litten. It is litten. First, I just a uh, cook, and then you, my student, and then we win championship. And uh, nobody know my name, but they say, that's Ludi's teacher. <laughs> 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 meaning it was meaning it was written. He's, he, he was saying in his way, hey, hey, kid. Yeah, hey, kid. I saw your trajectory. This is the way it was going. And why it was going that way is because you were never concerned about where it was going. Stay in that space. 
You had no designs or desires, and I didn't, yeah. except be the best right here, right now. Every rep, every drill, every calorie, everything right here, right now. And, uh, and, and the rest took care of itself. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like going into the Marines for the first time, though, as a young kid who had the promising career for doing the arts and being a, w- and a champion fighter? It like, was challenging. <laughs> it's how so? I was Even 26. more challenged. Yeah. That's quite, but that's was, quite was, a late start, I would, is it not? I guess to some people. But then I look around now. Uh, uh, look around now, Mr. English. Let me tell you what. I don't even see freaking men. My I don't even see males my age at 50 as men. You look fucking great, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. But you, what I mean, what I mean is that we never know our age, uh, James, uh, when we are called to accept the challenges and the sacrifices of manhood. And it's for everyone different. And I know, I know old men, that are not men because they never really in, in, embrace. And I don't mean just a Marine Corps. I don't mean just kickboxing. I don't mean just fitness. I mean, stepping into a space of responsibility and courage and courage. And that's what manhood's about. Um, yeah. So even at 26, I was very wide or I was skilled in fighting and athletic. And, and I, I was honor grad and Ironman, a boot camp Ironman. Because of that, I had a chance to try out for recon. There is no way to sign up for recon. Just like SPS, SAS, you can't sign up for it. You have to be the best at every level and then get a chance to sign, to try out, to try out. And then after the tryout, which is eight to 10 hour beasting in and out of the pool and tabbing and fighting and obstacle course, then you get a chance to go on to selection. So you got to try out to even go to selection, right? Yeah. Changed my life. I, I make it through, and now I'm a combat. Uh, I'm a combat diver, paratrooper, Dems, scout sniper, which is a very serious program in my world. Um, mountain warfare, Arctic warfare, desert warfare, uh, survival. I mean, you know, um, it was uh, urban sniper, urban reconnaissance, surveillance. Um, there's no limit. It, 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 I would recommend to any young man or young woman out there right now and if especially if you're american audiences i don't know how it is in the uk but america no matter who you are if you want to give everything you got join the military and give everything you got you will have every opportunity in the world to include education to include skills to include self-respect to include a confidence that you can't get really anywhere else. And so that's what was afforded to me. And of course, just like Chun Man Sit would say, it, it had to be written that I would go to war and I would come home. I'd have to go to war no matter how many wars I went to, I would come home. Little did I know coming home was just the beginning of the ultimate war for me. Yeah. A lot of kids who come from broken homes, who've been in children, homes, prisons, or like battle with addiction, they don't ever get out, Rudy. Really. You seem to have used the yeah. pain of your past to become one of the fittest, one of the strongest men in the military. <laughs> like, Thanks, you know, brother. But, Thanks, but brother. How, how did you fuel that fire to then push on to not, not be broken from the past? Mm. Mm. You know, I, I believe I'm naturally a romantic. I was talking to Jade, my missus, my lovely Jade, and she's been so instrumental in some healing of mine in the last four or five years. Um, because I'm a romantic, I believe in good, fighting evil. I'm a romantic, so I believe good must champion evil. But the only way for that to happen is for you to take up arms, spiritually, physically, emotionally. I believe in standing for what you believe in and what you, your character uh, tells you to be true. I, I read a lot. I read a lot. And I'm inspired by men and women throughout time that have had that courageous journey. I love comic books. I grew up reading comic books and drawing comic books and, and, um, and, and looking at in, in very simple prime colors, the fight of good and evil. And, uh, and by that kind of discipline, eventually, that, that's what, that's, I think, even when I was, you know, five or six days straight on cocaine and vodka uh, in my room, or haven't haven't eaten in two weeks and I'm on the streets in New York. 
or street fighting in a bar and in the street. I don't, I don't even know what happened to my opponents, but I know that I know that I fucked them up. Being in one bad female relationship after another, and and it, I don't know how I made it through that. And um, I definitely didn't have a plan. I didn't, definitely didn't care. But God, and, and it was written that I must get through it. Because if my community, my community, my veteran community, my Marine Corps, my recon, my sniper, my MARSOC, my, 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 my UK veteran community, if they lost me, looking now, I look back. If they lost me to suicide or prison, which happens to a lot of our people how many more would we lose? So, so with great power, you know, with, with that great, um, um, th that great abilities and, and uh, genetic predispositions and luck with the bullets going like this, with the RPG flying right behind my head, hit here. And then when I put my weapon up, I freaking put two right in his chest and my heavy gun happens to be off its T and E so he can free gun and my fucking gunner can lay on that trigger and destroy that vehicle and kill three more. The, these things they, they must have been written because it wasn't exactly skill it must be written and that is why i do that's why i continue on brother that's why i had to continue on what was it like having a suicidal thoughts really for being a strong man fit man a man who could accomplish anything he puts his mind to to then feeling as if there was no way out you know if there's anyone out there that is struggling or afraid or angry Please, maybe if I could share something with you that would help you. Um, after being a champion in my world and also having these abilities and skills and courage, meaning, uh, you know, I was not afraid of anybody, so I would fight all the time or people were afraid of me for some time. And I was young. I mean, I, I always look young, but I was, you know, I was handsome. I, I, I seemed... It seemed like everything was fine. Um, I was fucking dying inside. I had no reason that I could remember to live. So I thought maybe doing film and television or contracting or doing movies or street fighting or, or, or doing counter terror, anything that would be dangerous for me. That would be at least enough stimulation to keep me going to wake up tomorrow. And then when that, those things were not happening, I would just do hard drugs and drink. Um, I had a beautiful son. My son was taken away from me because I was a danger to the world. Not to my baby boy, but actually, who knows? Who knows? I went to court to fight. I bought a, bought a suit. And uh, I've never been arrested. I've been to court before in my life. I've been a law-abiding citizen, somebody that believes in good my whole life. But five years ago, six years ago, I was look, looking back now, I was dangerous. It's dangerous and, and a, a very dangerous person. Yes. Thank my son's mother was there. The family was there. The judge is talking to me. I stand up and I give, and I look at the judge. And I go, hold hold, this is a, a, a military um, hand and arm signal to stop. I guess in, in the judicious system, judicial system, you don't tell the fucking judge to hold. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't go well for me. I almost went to jail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was so down. I, I love and miss my baby son so much. And uh, so I went home, was up two or three days, just doing, doing cocaine and drinking by myself. I, always, I never went to clubs and stuff like that. It's not my thing. I would just stay by myself and watch documentaries and read and cry and rage and, and work out and, and look at pictures of, of, of who I used to be, look at pictures of my son. And I, you know, we're in America. We always have weapons. I, I definitely do. I mean, I use them. I use them for work. So I um, had a Glock 19 and, and I just fucking went condition one and put it in my mouth uh, because the pain was unbearable that I was repeating or I was seemed powerless 
to, uh, to escape the gravitas of the damage of my father, my mother, the, 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 the horrible environment that I came from, the, the poverty, the abuse, the neglect, the, and, and that now I'm not there for my son and, and, and that I used to be a hero and books have been written about what I did in combat and I have gold medals uh, fighting the best in the world. And, and yet here I am with nothing that matters. And brother, when I put that gun in my mouth, I just felt this force, like some kind of force, a, just this force that said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And it was, it was the creator's voice that's not in English or language to say, it's going to be okay because there's much more for you to do for this world and you will see your son. It was all these things, but it was just this feeling. I put the gun down and I knew what that feeling also demanded. I must take action right there. I get on the hook. I get on my, uh, the hook with my brother, Caesar call Caesar and CZ. I'm not well right now, brother. Can you please come to the house and take the guns? Cause I got assault rifles and stuff like that. Um, can you come take the guns, take my guns, brother. And he came and he took my guns. I uh, uh, cleaned up, no drugs, no alcohol <laughs> until like three or four days for me to finally fucking get myself together. And then I slept for about four or five days and then I started eating again. And then I said, okay, all right, my man, it's time to fucking fight. Let's go. What's the first step? And then I started getting some affairs in order and I was, and then I created force blue shortly after that force blue uh, started with just creating a mission for men like me and women too, men and women like me to go use their amphibious skills to rebuild the ocean and, and to protect the the innocent things in the ocean and um, we had no funding we had nothing and i just started working on it it started getting movement we started making effects then pepsi company comes in then the nfl now we're making effects and and uh, and i'm doing a little bit of work here and there a little bit of modeling and uh and then i meet jade and she's very young she's only 20 years old when i met her and uh I didn't know because of her poise and her confidence and the fact that she can shoot like an operator. I thought she was at least 28 because of the skills she has with freaking assault rifle, shotgun, pistol. She's the youngest three gun champion in America the, uh, of all time. I think she was champion at 17 or 18. So I, I didn't know that she was so young after we were together. And then I asked her how old she is. I said, I can't see you, you're too young. I left uh, California, I went to Hong Kong and then and then Finland. I'm always doing some military work too and some stuff and all I could do is think about her. And I said, you know what, Hell, I don't care what anybody thinks. I care what I feel. We've been together ever since, four years now, met five years ago. And uh, force blew, Jade struck. COVID. Oh, and I had a big show happening in History Channel. Shut down. COVID. Riots in LA. Jade and I with body armor and freaking uh, pistols um, with uh, gangbangers raiding and destroying um, Wilshire Boulevard, three blocks from our house, and combat zones and helicopters, and then fleeing to Idaho, to the extreme country, and then getting us, and then, and then having a knee surgery, and and just having her, myself, our beautiful dog, Hank, and my two cats, and then moving to the East Coast, and then SAS calls me. I don't even know it's SAS yet, because uh, once upon a time in Iraq, it hit in the UK. I'd been working on that with James Blumenthal and, um, for a few years, but I didn't, it was such a honest, humble work. I didn't know it would become something massive because of once upon a time in Iraq, Channel 4 and Minnow call me and they call me about SAS, brother. And I mean, it's, it's just the biggest, most honorable piece of work and, cult, and cultural impact that I've had in the entertainment business. And it's because it's truthful. It's with the boys.
Yeah. And that's kind of a fat, that's kind of the, the arc of what's happened in the last seven years. Yeah, roller coaster. You've like all, all the wars you've been in, killing people, like the, battling with addiction, battling. What's the, the, the most yes. challenging war that you've been in? Is it your own mindset sometimes, Rudy? I think, brother James, when a human being has had their parameters of left and right moved so far out, you know, um, when a man or woman uh, does not fear um, pain or death or has accepted them and learns to compute through that, mitigate risks, maybe shoot and kill some people right here, maybe call in an airstrike, give some information, check in on your teammates, saddle everybody up on your route back to the hard base, something else pops off. Next thing you know, you're doing a hostage rescue. And that's your every day. You're, you, you've expanded so far, there's no sanity. And, um, and I, think, I think what happens is when you have no sanity, you're gonna fill up this immense void with something. If you're blessed and have a good family, and a spiritual or religious background, and of course your physical fitness, those are all foundations for when you lose your sanity or lose your hope or purpose to fall back to. But if you do not have a family, let's say you're like, like us with a broken family, let's say, let's say you're wounded or injured. You know, a lot of my wounded and injured brothers have killed themselves because they feel less of who they are and they're in pain. Yeah. And then their girlfriend leaves them or their wife leaves them or their, you, you see, um, what's important if we struggle with, I think the root is depression. I think even addiction is just the after effect of trying to cure depression through a substance or through substance or sex or violence. But it, I, maybe it's the addictions all about hitting that, those chemicals in the brain. I think it's, uh, it, it all stems from depression and depression comes from a human, the, the human um, predisposition to sadness and emptiness when they do not have something worth living for. Yeah, so, I, so I would say f f find something to live for, yeah. find something to live for. What was it like your first time in war, Rudy? I was so overwhelmed with my duties. I didn't even think about anything except doing everything I was told right. I was uh, after the, after the, the towers were hit, I went straight in to fight to Pakistan, Afghanistan from the Persian Gulf. I was on a ship, force and readiness. I was the junior man in a five-man team, a platoon of 20 men, um, utilizing our reconnaissance and surveillance, our sniper skills, our direct action skills, and close air support. Um, I was the point man. I was a combat diver. I was a paratrooper. I was a scout sniper. I had I, I had Dems sur survival, um, um, close quarter battle martial. I had so many trainings and courses. You guys would call them. Still, I was a junior guy. My men that were in my team fought in Somalia, fought in Desert Storm, uh, fought in Haiti. We were magnificent. I was as skilled and as talented as I was. I was just the the, the point man. So. But remember, I'm, I'm an artist. So um, I was in charge in those old days. GPS at that tactical level was relatively new. Um, I had to do our routes on acetate overlays to put on the maps. And I would do our routes, secondary, tertiary, our DAR site, des designated area of recovery, our on-call targets where we had uh, artillery or, and or mortars dialed in, all this stuff. And I could draw so well, that was my job and set up the route. I was the point man to get us where we're going. And we're, of five men, four of us were scout snipers on top of everything we do and rangers. I mean, um, pretty badass. So all I did is focus on what I was to do. Driving. I've never driven a Humvee. We don't drive. We don't work in Humvees. Not back then. We freaking fly from the sky. We use our combat dive, amphibious insertion techniques. We use helicopters. I'm driving a big vehicle for the first time with a big heavy gun with one night vision ocular. 
on my eye. No, on this one, in this eye, so I could see my team leader who's over here, 70 kilometers at night, clandestine to the base of a mountain, and then dig in a hole so big to put the vehicle in, and then cam it up with, with the cami net, and then put on 150 pounds, 200 pounds of kit and batteries and laser designators and sniper systems and ammo and water and patrol up this mountain. And then as the sun's coming up, set in and then start covering an area. It was immense, man. It was fucking immense. And I came back, well, you know, a little war, a little time, a little time war hero and uh, excited to see my family. But as soon as I got home, I swear I was only home for two months before the word on the street is to prepare for Iraq long before you knew it long before civilians knew it, we were going to Iraq. And so I started preparing and fighting and training and preparing for that then, which I guess your audience would know from generation kill. If your audience is, uh, if they watch HBO's generation kill, that is about the true story about my team, my platoon leading the entire first Marine division uh, in the invasion of Iraq and cutting off the head of the snake and becoming, you know, war heroes which led to many other things. How far ahead are you from the mainstream media and the civilians' information that we get to use to go to Iraq? How far are you in front? A couple of weeks, month? Sometimes as much as six months or a year. No way. Fucking hell. We have that's top, so yeah. yeah, we have top secret uh, TSSCI, special compartmentalized information clearances, and there's heavy shit going on all the time. Yet, brother... You don't know yet. I never knew the big picture. I just knew what the fuck I was going to do right here. So when I came back from Afghanistan in 2002, late 2002, you vaguely remember, bro, this, uh, the footage of the Al Qaeda training camp in Kandahar of the freaking clowns swinging on the monkey bars and coming out and shooting these freaking clowns with their black freaking headdresses swinging on the clown. Do you yeah. vaguely remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hit that place. I fucking hit that place. Wham, 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 wham. Hit that place. Our team and our platoon hit that place. And then we took casualties, or we took uh, enemy prisoners of war, controlled them, took them back. Brother, I'd never seen those videos until I came home. I'd never seen footage that you guys were watching as we were preparing to invade Afghanistan. I didn't, I was so mission specific about who I'm linking up with, who I've got to kill, what we're doing in the terrain. We didn't see any videos. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I, when I saw it a year later at home, I'm like, oh, surreal. Yeah, because in your platoon, you only let your, your men phone home once a week. Is that correct? By the back then in, in the heavy combat um, only letters that would get every three or four months would come back and forth. No calls home. Only my commander called his wife and his wife told the wives they're still alive. That is it. Is that just to keep their head in the game? You got, and I think it's absolutely important. I think actually, actually it saves lives. And uh, this was, there was no, there's no fucking Instagram or fucking Facebook and all this fucking bullshit back then. People were not obsessed with being fucking turned on with the stupid light box. Um, it, it, I, I think I think for mental health, the way that we did it was the right way. I think caring too much about what's going home that you have no control of will take you away from being right here and men will die. What's the story about you fighting three weeks straight? Is that true? Or is that a myth? Like no true. sleep, nothing, just... Totally true. What's that story, Rudy? It's just, brother, can you imagine? We're fighting and moving through Iraq, but there's no time to stop. And every time you stop, you got to jump on out and fucking uh, dig in. Or there's a village there and you got to run through it. And if anybody fights, you got to kill them. And then you got, and then you're on the radio, and then you're giving reports, and then your team leader shot. Now your team leader, and I mean, an extremity of pace, an extremity of fatigue. But but remember this: what's your choice? What does anybody have a choice to like say? Okay, I'm gonna, we can rest, and we're gonna, we're gonna pause the war, 
hey, let's just pause the war because second platoon is tired. No, General Mattis from the president is saying, fucking go. Go. You think my commander, platoon commander, is going to say to then my battalion commander, a colonel, hey, colonel, the team's tired. The platoon, you know, they already killed. Uh, they made some great long distance kills. They freaking uh, dropped some air. And, you know, Sergeant Patrick was wounded. Rudy's taking over. They could really use a day off. You think he's going to say that to the colonel and the colonel's going to tell the general and the general's going to call the president? Hey, you know what? Rudy's really fatigued and really sad because his idol and best friend has been wounded and now he's only got three other men. You think that's going to happen? No. You freaking go. Uh, it's, uh, many people can't imagine that because they've never been in the extremity of, of being conquered or conquering somebody else. So how Imagine do you, how it was in the Mongols. Yeah. How do you become one of the elite then? Like in the top three hundred, like what's the training for that, Rudy? Like we've got the SAS, SBS, the special forces, like they're unbelievable men. I've met majority of some of them have been on this show, and you can see the mental toughness. You can also see the battle, but you can see they just push through that pain. How do you then become one of the elite, one of the fittest, one of the strongest, one of the ones if the shit hits the fan, you're fucking on speed dial? I love that. You know, brother, for me, it was a combination of the romanticism and shame. Shame. To be afforded an opportunity to witness what is excellent. When you witness other excellent men like you've never witnessed in your life, they happen to be your instructors, You've now witnessed, you, you cannot unwitness what is excellent and what is truthful. Now you've witnessed it and you know what it takes to get there, which means simply do what you're told and never give up. It's that simple. Do what you're told and never give up. Um, and I was very, it was very hard on me. My selection was very difficult for me. Um, Everybody hated my guts. I didn't have a single friend. Why? I was the new Marine because I was the honor grad and Iron Man of my courses before. Everyone else had been in the Marine Corps for four, six, eight years. I had Marines in my selection, R Rangers, uh, paratroopers, scout snipers, drill instructor, all one man just to get to recon. It would be like being the best best in your forces and now you finally get a chance to go to b squadron or you get a chance to be with foxy at, at freaking sas x squadron you worked your whole life six five, four six eight years even been to war but there's only so many slots to even try out so i was there trying out with everybody else everybody hated my guts everybody thought i was a piece of shit because i didn't rate to be there now of course there's people that talk shit and some of them i had to fight and beat up because I'm not a real big guy. Uh, then I was 175 uh, through my whole military career, 180, because I run and swim all the time. Uh, and now in my older age, I put on some weight. Now I'm 190. Um, I had to endure selection all on my own. And, and that was important. I think I lean on that when I was struggling with drugs and alcohol. Also, I was in a mental institution for a whole year. I was put away. I remembered, well, Rudy, you've been through hard things before alone. You can do it. Um, incredibly competitive. Unlike the SAS show, uh, Who Dares Win show. Brother, in real selection, if you fail, that means 80% underneath or on any physical uh, event or don't make the time. In our case, it's not even the time. It's the first four guys or the first five guys. And this course starts with 80 people. The first five make it, everyone else fails. First five make it, everybody else fails. If you fail something twice, you're standing in front of the commander and then you're getting kicked out. So there is no, like, even being tough isn't enough. You have to give everything you got, be at the front every time. You got to want it so bad that you're willing to be in that much pain to be at the front. Do you think that helped you by being an outsider and nobody really want to be a friend? Do you think that pushed you? I think to so. I think, to so. Them? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time. I think so. 
I think so. Yeah. What I had nobody toughest, to call. What was the toughest part of that training? I didn't know how to swim very well. Um, I'm from the Midwest and, you know, we don't have pools. We don't have pools and, and training tanks if you're poor. And uh, I didn't grow up in the coast. I wasn't rich. I didn't know how to swim. I was a second class swimmer. I was officially not a strong enough swimmer to even be there, but because I was so dominant on the indoctrination on that 10 hour beasting, they said, fuck, we can work with this kid. I didn't know that. I just thought I was just a piece of shit that was lucky. Um, we had to do a uh, Ford rep, fording a river, um, report Ford rep on the NATO format, NATO format checklist. All of us warriors have something called NATO formats in which everybody in NATO has the same format to do military operations so that we can work together, even if we meet each other for the first time and we're in war, like World War II or something like that. Um, I've been awake for four days and being gassed and being beasted and everybody's carrying, I guess you guys would call it 50 kg packs, 50 kg packs, real rifles so that you have to clean them all the time. You're in the swamps, you're in the freaking ocean and you're in the mud and you're in the hills, always in the forest and in the ocean. So you've got to clean your weapons and they rest. My team hates my guts. I'm a complete lone wolf. I'm a Lance Corporal, that's an E3, I have no rank. My instructor says, uh, Leathernecks, that's a term of endearment for Marines, Leathernecks. Uh, if one of you motivators does this Ford rep just right, you might get a couple hours of sleep tonight. I said, fuck yeah. And I thought, man, if I do this, and because nobody wants, oh, it's winter time. It's freezing, there's still ice. There's ice along the sides of the river. Nobody wants to get in the fucking river. There's only a five-man team. I thought, well, oh, maybe if I do this good, my teammates will finally see that I'm valuable. <laughs> maybe they'll finally like me. <laughs> so I take the fucking mission. I've got these little plastic bottles to put dirt in that I have to dive every 10 feet down soil composition swim to the top tread water with my rifle and fighting gear and then in at nighttime cover darkness and write on a plastic slate a crayon it's fucking freezing cold it's freezing brother i think well i'm going to take off all my clothes but my silkies so at least i have something relatively dry to put on after i cross this river for an hour diving down taking soil samples in the cover of darkness, treading water with my rifle, writing down the data, how deep it is and what uh, composition it is and getting across and get across the fucking river. I'm fucking getting, I'm going hypothermic. I'm starting to shut down mentally, but I'm fucking going, I'm fucking shivering. My instructor says, fucking Leatherneck, you're fucking making recon marines the world proud. It's cover of darkness. I'm almost like a little baby. I'm going, oh, yeah, because my fucking brain is breaking down. And he goes, follow me. Follow behind him. And he leads me uh, through this ravine. He goes, right face. And I turn right. All the instructors are there with machine guns and gas. They shoot machine guns over my head. Wham, 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 wham. Throwing gas at me. And I just start fucking running. I start running and running and running. On our next one, well, all right. I kept running and running until I fell off of this ravine, up and down off this ravine into um, another river tributary. As I fell 20 feet head over feet, my rifle came off of me or the sling came off. M16, hit the water. I hit the water. No rifle, no rifle. And I'm searching for my rifle in the cover of darkness. I'm seeing the moon through all these trees in the forest. And I'm looking for my rifle. And then I hear, Reyes, Reyes. I'm like, oh my God, it's one of my fucking teammates. Maybe somebody's here to help me. I'm, I'm no shirt, fighting gear. My rifle's gone, boots and silkies. And and I'm, sh I'm breaking down, but I'm also searching for my rifle. So scared. And uh, then I hear something behind me and I turn and look and I see two 
shadow figures that look like monsters coming out of the water in black to some kind of creatures of the Black Lagoon coming out in this black fucking river, coming out like this, these big fucking black monsters. As I clock them, I am hit hard from behind. And I almost black out, but I step forward. And then an arm is thrown around my neck. Obviously, these guys didn't know I was a Shaolin champion. There's one thing I can do, and that's fucking fight. So I pivot. I grip the man, throw him over my shoulder. And as he's flying, keep positive control and smash him into these roots of the trees that are, remember, I'm in a fucking ravine and a canal and the roots are exposed. And he smashes into the fucking roots and I hear him go, I hear this thing. It's all in black. I hear it go, Ugh. and right there, my heel hits. I feel it hit my sling keeper on my sling. I'm up to about mid die in the water. And I hear clink, clink. I feel it on my fucking boot. I get down there and I grab my fucking M16. I take it over and I'm about to fucking smash this fucking thing's head in half. And right as this is happening, my instructor, Crawford, Craw Daddy, the legend, uh, Recon Marine, blows a whistle. <laughs> and I kind of snap. And he goes, Leatherneck. Whenever I hear his voice, it snaps me. He's my instructor. Leatherneck. You know, calm down. Great fucking fight, Leatherneck. And I realized that these are my instructors in black paint, in wetsuits, in rebreathers. They've been fucking clocking me the whole time. Funny thing about this story. Oh, and then they find my team. My team's all asleep. So um, I'm punished and I have to run all the way back to the command post. I find out later they run me that 20 miles because I was close to being dead from hypothermia. And there was no way because of the cloud cover that had come in that the helicopters were going to be able to get me out. The only way to keep me alive is to keep me running and build up heat. I was so thin back then. I get back to the command post months later, years later, some other guys that were on the course that are, years later that I ran into said, Rudy, holy shit, brother. I was with my team, you know, 10 clicks away. And, and I, on the radio of the instructor, I heard that you were being attacked by the instructors. And then they said, oh shit, you know, Reyes just fucking body slammed gunnery sergeant grandin oh my god he's gonna kill him he heard they heard it on the radio <laughs> the, anyway, it's fucking immense man can you imagine how fucking heavy yeah that's and that's just man. i mean i so know shit. <laughs> how did see when you pass election see when you pass election to become one of the elite of the elite did you feel satisfied Rudy, or was there always something missing always competitive However, I felt like it was the home I was always looking for. Felt like it was the home that I'd always been dreaming about. Recon was the home I'd always been dreaming about. But I, but I, I knew to keep that home and to have space at that table, I had to be number one at everything I did. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. How, so you were a sniper also? Yeah, Scout Sniper. Very prestigious well, program. Your people, if they look up the Marine Corps Scout Sniper program, very serious. What's the training like for that, Rudy? Oh, immense. After being a reconnaissance Marine and that confidence, you apply it to everything. So uh, combat uh, water survival swimmer, then combat diver, which is a very fucking heavy course, by the way. Um, especially when you're from the Midwest. You've never been in oceans before. Um, and then ranger and jump school, not no big deal, but, but when you get into the free fall. But scout sniper is the... Jedi Zen Buddhist course. Um, there's so much mathematics to learn and physical manipulations with the rifle. But more than that, like a huntsman, you learn to feel the land and the wind and read terrain. I can read maps like very few people. The way special operations men read maps and look at maps and terrain it's very different than anybody else in the world. You read maps like they are people you know, like someone that you know, how you can hold onto their shoulder or give them a hug. That is how you see the terrain. 
and how you will move through the terrain. The vegetation and the colors that are discrepancies or that you want to blend in and how to find dead space, which is completely against human nature. Human nature is attracted to objects. Our eyes are attracted to objects. We are attracted to objects. We'll hide behind a tree. We want it. No. Scout sniper is in the dead space where there's nothing. So you're thinking, well, how can you hide in nothing? Well, there's a few ways. Anyway, it really immense. Three or four months of a heavy, heavy stalking, shooting, running, fighting. It's magnificent. Did you see that as an art? It is an art. It is an art. I am, I am, uh, my, my, I've got a brother named Bacalary Buck, uh, legendary Marine Corps scout sniper um, that now works for Leopold Optics. Of course, my idol my team leader in the invasion, Sergeant Patrick, Master Gunnery Sergeant Marsock, after he just retired two years ago, uh, Master Sniper, the kind of man, the kind of man that can see a drop of blood and then find the next one 30 feet away in the bush and then the next one, and then we'll find the elk. I have another brother, Walt Hasser and Doc Bryan, two other brothers, such fine snipers, that uh, this is true and witnessed. They stalked a white-tailed deer. And as Walt was within 20 feet with the bow, Timmy Bryan reaches up and slams his fucking knife right into the fucking deer's neck, cuts that fucking neck out, fucking bleeds it out right there. Stalked the deer to um, to uh, grip the fucking antlers and then uh, fucking uh, slam him in the neck for the kill us country boys in america take this stuff very seriously it's really an art it's a very high level art and there's some really magnificent people i had a man called craig harrison on who was a master sniper craig was the world's longest sniper oh yeah he was, was that was that mad. uh canadian yeah, Canadian brother, it was, yeah, it was mad, legend, bro. And um, <laughs> he was, yeah, he's fucking. But he was saying he can be somewhere on a mission and be there for two weeks straight without moving, yeah. without moving. Yeah, yeah. Like people don't. Yeah. And the, when they judge it, like I don't really know too much about it, but he says you've got to judge by not just the wind, but the movement of the the earth, the spin of the earth, and gravity, the spin and of the earth, the, the atmospherics. There's so much into it, brother. I'll, I'll tell your audience. That man, I'm sure, has a stacked data book. Every shot he's ever taken, he has written the data, not just of the shoot. How did he feel? What did he eat that day? Um, how did the ammo that you lay down, so we lay the ammo down the same way before we load it, so the powder is the same fucking uh, way, so the burn's the same way. Yeah. And the and, and your and, and that dad. So imagine this master sniper brother. What's his name again? I, I remember Harrison. from our military. I bet he has a data book with so much reference that he's been there, done that. That he's a supercomputer slash um, Michelangelo, mm -hmm. Michelangelo painter, you know, illustrator, sculptor, engineer yeah. of the sniper weapon. That's yeah. what that's about. That's it. He was Incredible. doing so much damage that Al Qaeda wanted his head and had to move him and his wife out to protect them. It's a fucking mad story, unbelievable. But he fucking was fucking what a hero. Yeah, proper mate. He was the elite of the elite, and he's a legend. He's a yeah. legend. That's why the sniper programs, the sniper programs are so effective. By the way, uh, you, uh, us and Royal Marine Commandos, we have an exchange for like the last 50 years. We send each other's instructors to each other's schools and then teach. It's an incredible, special relationship we have. Canadians are our brothers as well. Um, as a fighting system, a sniper is the most effective and efficient weapon system in the world. Yeah, it's unbelievable that the, the, the yeah. craft that goes into it. Like, Rudy, what was it like? Yeah. You've done so much. What was it like to take a life for the first time in battle? I mean, what you're engaging with and doing is just so out of water, so uh, beyond uh, description. Um, it, <laughs> I mean, I mean, imagine blasting through the breach in the middle of the night and 
the incoming fucking weapons and rockets are coming and your aircraft is coming over the sides and rockets are fucking smashing all around you and and the radio's on and in in you know lives are being extinguished and um there's there's a lot of funny things um um We were being run through uh, a vehicle checkpoint. I mean, there's so many times. I mean, the, the first time I killed somebody was just a long shot. And then actually the first time was just doing close air support and then machine gunning what was left. But then it got more intimate and more intimate and more intimate. I mean, Afghanistan and now the invasion. And now more intimate where sometimes they're still alive a little bit and you're going to fucking smash, you know, you got to dead check them or, you know, this guy's got his throat shot out and his fucking half his chest is hanging out. And you know, he's, you're going to save your fucking rounds for him. He's still, oh, oh, he's like, oh, but you know, he's fucking gone in a second. Um, and then, and then, uh, you know, and then there's, there's, there's children uh, uh, caught in the middle uh, running, you know, you got a, you got a civilian vehicle running through your checkpoint with your, wire out and your your chem lights and, and your arabic sign that they run through the lines at full speed because they've got death squads behind them and because we we we, we very often we very often stupid entitled first worlders all of us first worlders we assume everybody can read and write and I'm fired up right now. I'm fucking done with all this racism and all this freaking gender shit and all this bullshit. It's all fucking bullshit. There's no reason at all anybody in the first world cannot man manifest the very greatest in their life. They have nothing to fucking say. So we assume that these fucking good people, they, why, if they're running through our fucking lines in the cover of darkness, they're here to suicide bomb. So we're going to fucking kill every one of them. We find out, of course, they don't know how to read. We think that everybody knows how to read. No, they don't. People talk about the, and, and you know what? And any of you, your audience out there, Marxist, communist, fucking any of that, you can go fuck yourself. You come to some Marxist countries or some totalitarian regimes and you see what it's really like. So yeah, you go there and, you, and you're pulling out the bodies, hoping someone's alive and, and you know, they're, they're expiring and you, you have, you, you know, you, you have a, um, you have de uh, civilian um, vulnerable people in pieces because you have to fucking smoke them because what other choice would we have? And by the way, there's no time for interviews. Matter of fact, General Mattis has just told my commander that we still have to fucking go. And by the way, what are you wasting time for? I mean, how do you even express that to anybody? You know, how do you even express that? You know, there's a lot of fakers out there, brother. Pretend they've been there, done that, or fucking done the fucking hard shit. You know what? Man? There's nothing like like romantic, except when you win. Like except when you live. Like when they're fucking coming at you and pouring fire, and and you know after those men were killed on that bridge, you know I ate chow with those men in Fallujah. Hours later, they're hanging up on fire and drugged through the streets on that bridge. We came back to chop them out of there. And you're happy as hell to kill. You're happy as hell to kill the enemy. That's the truth. Anybody that tries to hurt you and your friends, you're happy as hell to kill them. That's yeah, the truth. Uh, not being in that situation, it's hard to call those shots. Even the sniper who I was talking about had to make sh sh um, calls like that. The woman had the burka yeah. on, but she had the two kids. Yeah. But the, the call was, she's she's got a suicide bomb and, and sure as, as fuck, That's she it. had the bomb inside her that... These people are willing that's, to kill as well. The world would be an amazing place, brother. If that's there right. There's no wars, but there is wars. Like you have, people have that's to fight true. wars. Like you say, a year, two years before people even hear about it. Like the streets are safe in the UK. There's a lot of shit going on in the UK now, but the streets are as safe as they can be because of people like yourself, like true heroes, like people who <laughs> serve in the missions that nobody knows, but. People need to understand the, the mental torture that you as men have to go through by doing what you have to do as well. Like, to call those shots, nobody ever wants to be in that position, but somebody has to do it. And it's yeah. men like yourself who have to do it. Like, how do you then deal with that to then 
is that why you keep so busy, train so hard and, and push the boundaries is to numb the sort of pain and misery and calling those shots in your life? Yeah, you know what, James? For a long time, I did have to numb it. I had to numb it first with work, uh, workaholic. Be, be a workaholic. Be an achiever. Be be a winner. Be all of these words. All these things that like that are that are elements of of of, of elements used in a human being's improvement and uh, elements used to overcome struggle. These are elements. But that's not the end all be all. One day you will slow down at me, like myself at 50 years old. One day you will sit with yourself and you will think and you'll feel and you will question. I pray you will question. What is my purpose? What is my purpose? And, um, and now I'm in a very interesting new frontier of of work spirit and family balance this is the most balance i've ever been james this is the happiest i've ever been in my life since i was born this is the most secure and 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 loved i've ever been and yet here i am what i've got what 30 more years and i do dangerous shit for work still by the way i've got what 30 more years and, and no matter, like even doing great 40 more years, maybe me because I'm, you know, Shaolin, maybe, maybe 50 more years, but I'm halfway in my life. And I'm finally, for the first time, uh, being loved and supported and, and have a reason to live that's outside of me killing myself for it. First time. Yeah, that's um, a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's thing. where I'm at. I'm very thankful. Balance. Yeah, yeah. How we'll touch on as well that like, how hard is it so people can understand to lose brothers when you're in war? Like I don't think people realise the the extreme shit that you have to go through, not just mentally and physically, but emotionally and, and spiritually. Like for because you were a Buddhist, you, you you studied Buddhism. Is that correct as well? I did. I did. I was heavy into my Zen Buddhism because of martial arts and transcendence from poverty and martial art. Um, and competing and fighting and all the money I make for fighting, I put right back into my training. I, I was, I'm, I've always been ethically at odds with materialism and, and such. I was hoping to talk about that with you a little bit only because even now, you know, I, I'm, I've got some fame and I've got some notoriety and you know, I'm marketable and marketable people position me and pressure. Well, why aren't you doing this? Like, what about you branding this? What about your, I can't fucking handle saying it, but I'm going to tell the truth about it. What about your Instagram? Why are you not selling something? What about your branding? I'm ethically against for me with having such a very emotional and intimate and, and, um, and purpose uh, given life and luck to be alive to then turn into some kind of selling machine. I, I, I've, you know, 23 of my men died in, in training my first year at the unit in training in 1999 oh. in training 23 because the shit we do is so dangerous. Uh, uh, fuck a uh, paratrooper uh, halo operations with massive kit at night. Um, Ship takedowns in the organ, as you guys say, in the sea, at sea, from the freaking helicopters, and the fast ropes go down. It's, it's so fucking dangerous as shit. You talk to the boys. You ever talk with Billy and Foxy? They'll tell you the same thing, man. You know how many of their brothers fucking die in training? So, you know, here you are going to funerals and pouring beer for the senior brothers, and you're a you're young recon marine. And you're dealing with death all the time and, and seeing wives fucking crying and children crying and little babies in the arms. It's very fucking serious. It's very serious. But if you think back, James, was this any, di if we were back 2000 years ago, it'd still be, the, it would be the same. Just everybody was involved 2000 years ago. Everybody was either being conquered or conquering or their warriors were winning or being killed in the, they had sisters or mothers uh, who had lost their sons or husbands. All of us did 2,000 years ago. Now we're so separated. 
You know, that that's somebody else doing that. Our forces, which by the way, your brother, my brothers here, they love America, how much they're respected and loved when they come to America. Um, on the planes, they're clapped for. They get to walk on and off first. And everyone in America, when they find out that their brothers were in the forces, and, and plus they're, you know, I was just in New York with Billy, and um, and we had an incredible time with Ian Asbury, the lead singer of The Cult. He had a show there. We all got to see each other with our wives and our friends and our other brothers. And we had American young men coming over to, to say hello to Billy. Billy Billingham, you know, can I take a picture of you? Thank you for your service. Everybody gives these guys thank you for your service. And, but, you know, we've lost a lot of that connection and intimacy with each other that, wow, we do have a fighting class because to enforce trade, to enforce and scare evil people, to have free trade, to have human rights and women's rights, you must be a bad motherfucker. You're not going to, with diplomacy, make people good. You have to fucking scare them or kill them to make them good. That's the truth. Why do you think as human beings we, we do want to conquer and kill? Do you think it's greed? But <laughs> you have done the Buddhism side. I've touched on near enough every religion. And I've never, now I'm just kind of being, I believe I've got the goodness in the soul when God inside me to do good on the planet. But Yes. Sometimes I've got the evil streak as well to self-destruct and hate and, and have vengeance. Yeah. Why do you think a human uh, being, why do you think we're all still at war? Not just internally, but externally. That's a good point. It's just, what the fuck is that about, Rudy? I didn't have a rage until, um, I think maybe, I think maybe I was just so scared of maybe, releasing my pain I never let the rage out until I was until I got into the film business in Hollywood and had been out of combat for two years it came out because I was drinking and doing and drugging so hard it started coming out uh, my wife uh, the reason why I left my wife is because she was having an affair you know I talked to a lot of military people and they're always running around on their wives and um, they're always basically stuck as teenagers I've never been a teenager I've never been a teenager my entire life. I was a child and then an adult by about six or seven years old, except uh, not corrupted like an adult. You know, I wasn't chasing women and I wasn't doing drugs at six or seven years old. But I was making very serious, hardcore decisions about how to survive and protect my brothers. I was being, uh, I was sexually abused when I was 11 uh, by an uncle. And when I realized what's happening, I fight. I fight this big man off. I mean, a tiny thing. I had malnutrition. I had rotten, rotten teeth. All my teeth are fake. They had to be removed later when I went into the orphanage. Um, and, um, and I grabbed little Michael and Caesar and I put them underneath a coffee table and stand in front of them to guard my two little brothers under a coffee table to sleep. So I was an adult when I was very young. And then you get into being this freaking mystique video game freaking movie star war hero type of thing and it's the bitches it's the drugs it's the freaking party you know what it's an illusion i think that is why i got so angry angry at myself but i was finding myself with the hell's angels with with the fucking you know, with the hot chicks with all that stuff and it was eating my fucking heart away and i started not giving a fuck um, and I realized that's, that's, that's what PTSD is or mental, mental, I don't like calling it mental illness. I don't think it is. I think it's mental injury, spiritual injury from being at odds in your heart with what's happening in your life. Yeah. To stop loving yourself. Love is the strongest force on this planet. Like I, when you were talking about surrendering, it's funny because I've always struggled with my relationships with really. like people don't really get past three months because I feel so vulnerable that they're going to hurt me. Yeah. And a, wo a woman says, you need to stop saying you're, because I used to say I need to surrender to love. This woman says, look, surrendering means you've lost. She says, you need to start accepting your destiny. So when a woman comes into your mm. life, don't say surrender mm. to love, say just accept your destiny and, and I understood that more and now I've got a partner now with, we're in great terms I am still feel vulnerable sometimes because part of me feels as if I should be am I not doing enough because 
always want more in life, always thought fame and fortune would heal my pain. But if anything, it scattered the pieces even more. It becomes more shattering and it's understanding that everything that you've got in life is internally. Because even that these interviews, this is a very powerful conversation that will help change lives. But the social media, yes. the money, the, the all the bullshit, the, the, the bright lights, it doesn't mean fuck all. Like it genuinely doesn't. You will not find your happiness and your peace there. But as human beings, we're always testing the waters to figure out what fits and what yes. doesn't. Like, how yes. did you end up in the mental institute, really? That was only eight, eight or nine years ago. I was put away for a whole year. Was that the whole build up of everything you've been through? Was that with the yeah, wife cheating and that guess, as well? The, the sexual abuse, the, uh, the fighting and wars? Every, and everything I stuffed, I stuffed away and everything I thought I could overcome by being the best. And then, fi uh, you know what? And I don't know if other people have talked about this on your program. I hurt many women probably that loved me after I got out of war or no, after once, once I, this, this fog filled chapter called success hit me where I'm around nothing but LA, New York and London people high-end freaking drugs, sexy women, all this, all this shit, to be honest with you, all these fucking, all these fucking douchebags, men and women douchebags on Instagram put up as like that is success. They're douchebags. They're fucking scumbags. What they are. Um, that was all around me. I knew it was all false and corrupt, yet how would I even begin to express that I am dying inside and everyone around me is telling me this is success. Everyone around the culture, the whole world's culture is telling me this is success. Living in, in Venice Beach and in LA and being flown to places and to be, and yet inside I knew it was all false. And then I was also in a relationship where the woman completely treated me like fucking garbage. And I guess maybe deep down inside, I thought I deserved it. Yet then I have um, my son with his mother and I'm not available emotionally, spiritually, physically at all. And I just, I don't know enough of these successful people. I hope that they actually get out there and tell the truth about this. Um, and that's, you know, I had to lose it all, brother. I almost killed my life. I almost took my own life. And then the idea that, you know, my father who never came back for me and and uh, my mother who abandoned me and all of the fucking neglect and abuse and destruction. I mean, it was fucking horrible. Um, I was trying to work out, you know, at like the fifth or sixth or seventh school I'd been to uh, between 10 and 12 years old and my teeth had rot that rotted out and fallen and and then I had this infection in my gums that I have to cut open with a knife every morning or or take a flame to a uh, safety pin and cut open the boils to drain the pus. My mouth stunk so bad of rot. The rot got back into my eye that I never smiled, James. I didn't smile until years later that I finally was able to get these fake teeth but I'm that are chipped and shit now but I always there's very few pictures of my youth first of all when you're an orphan nobody gives a fuck about you to take a picture in the first place my mouth is closed like this always so having to face these things to fight on and then as hard as it was changed when I went to Iraq and Afghanistan and Kenya and Uganda and freaking Mongolia and I've seen fucking destruction and poverty and me teaching karate at fucking orphanages in Africa and Mozambique. And the children there are there because their parents were murdered because they were stealing food. I said, okay, Rudy Reyes, uh, you've had the greatest lottery ticket of, of all time. Your dad and mom gave you great genes. You love sport. You're born in the United States of America. I had it all going for me. That helped change the pain 
that I used to have or that I used to dwell on so bad. I always see it all as gifts. I even see the fucking challenges and struggles of my youth in combat as gifts. Every bit of it has been a gift for me. Yeah, you've done amazing to be through what you've been through to where you are now and still have the smile on your face. And I love you, brother. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I genuinely <laughs> do. I think best. we're going to be friends, mate. And once you yeah, we will, it, brother. Uh, we are. Okay, we well, are. Yeah, I think it's fucking great. You've got a phenomenal story. That like, see when you were, j- just before we finish up, mate. I won't keep you too more, much longer. But it's, it's such a powerful conversation that people are going to take so much from you not giving up, not quitting, pushing through the dark periods. And that's what it's all about because so many people are struggling. Even myself still struggles every fucking day. I do day. sometimes too, Up brother. Here, like, I hear you. Yeah, and it's fucking painful. But how? see, when you were in the mental institute, how did you get through that time? Because you've been through so many fucking wars. You've done so much shit. You've, you've been used majority of your fucking life. Like, how did you yeah. get through that dark period? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt, bro. You know what? You're right. No, it's the <laughs> truth. I was reflecting on this recently, and that's why, in some ways, you know, my my woman. Oh, brother, you gotta. You know what? You gotta reach out to Jade sometimes. She'll blow your mind. She should yeah, be on your brother. show. She's magnificent. Yeah. She says, "Baby, have you ever considered that you uh, you have some arrested development?" And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" <laughs> well, you talk to the cats. And by the way, the love of my life outside of Jade is my little female cat named Pants. Her name is Pants. She's black and white, and she's very, very shy, but she loves me and always rubs up on me and plays with me and will run me back to play with her in this special place with this fuzzy blanket to paw on so that then she runs to the treat so I can give her treats. She's sweet enough to me to not just say, Daddy, I'm using you for treats. No, I'm going to play with you first just so you know you're... You, you, so that you are valued. That's how my cat fucking relates to me, and and I'm such a ch- such a child with my animals and with Jade and with my my loved ones, and it's because I never was a child, um, and because I was used, uh, and then actually learned to use myself. I used myself too. It's not like I was a strategic. Uh, um, drive for economic success or um, or uh, prestige or status. Never, never interested. But I used myself. Rudy, you can take more pain. You can work longer hours. You can always be in camera ready condition, regardless of what you're doing in combat or how much your heart's hurting because you have not seen your son in four years or that uh, you have uh, physical po- problems from immense combat, um, uh, um, brain chemical problems in which I still struggle for sleep every night, especially now that I'm away from my missus and I'm on task. I struggle. I struggle. I, can barely, I can't go to sleep. And I have to exhaust myself with physical fitness and running the mountains to even think about going to sleep because I feel not safe, um, not intellectually. My nervous system is not safe. My physiology is scared that fucking death is right around the corner. Not my brain. I know. I know I'm okay. That's how dynamic it is when you push yourself so hard so long. Um, but the, the other side of that, uh, the childishness and the hope, the, 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 the childlikeness and the, the child in me. It's not childlike. It's the truth. I read my comics and I, I watch my science fiction programs and and, um, and of course, I watch my very highbrow stuff too, and ra- read very highbrow stuff. Uh, the other side of it, it is buttressed with the life and death struggles and destruction that Mother Nature conspires to compete because it makes stronger life forms. Human beings have taken that due to our success as a life form. As a life form, we be- become very successful. Now we are corrupting, we are corrupting and uh, corroding. And it's up to you and I, it's up to people telling the truth and being the truth to steer the course for our children. I don't give a, you know, I don't really care if the rest of society is really interested in where I'm going and how I'm doing it. But I know my men and women that are rebuilding reefs and doing ocean conservation. I know the lives that we touch, SAS, SAS touches lives. And these, all these men have been through everything to get to the hardest shit in the world, just like myself. That's what I'm going to focus on. The struggles, 
and the competition taken for every life form to be where it's at, we humans have become so successful that now we have forgotten how blessed we are and how hard our ancestors fought to be here. So I just stay grounded in that. That's how I do what I do. I stay grounded in that. Yeah, that's the main thing, brother. What was the main reason for re leaving the Marines, Rudy? Brother, after that last one in Fallujah and Ramadi. Damn, brother, I did such heavy fucking shit, brother. <laughs> you know, I. you see my looks? Um, I dressed as a contractor or as a laundry worker as an indigenous, as a, as a host nation, a Turk in the laundry room in the big base because we had fucking spies on the base and I'd leave the base into a taxi cab so that the um, Mujahideen would attempt to kidnap me so that they could cut my head off on video by putting out those terror videos and I, have you James, have you ever seen anybody get their fucking head cut off? No. Fucking never fucking forget it. Never fucking forget it. You'll never fucking forget it. You know what? Matter of fact, when I hit this terrorist network and I got their fucking data, we watched what they were doing and we saw them taking people, saw, sawing people's heads off. I mean, it filled me with such hate and rage and absolutely resolved to fucking kill every single fucking one of them. So I put myself out there to be kidnapped, but underneath my dish dash, my robes, I've got my fucking gun, plate carriers, I've got my comms, and i got cutoff teams, and we're drawing them out, brother. The reason why we're drawing them out is so that we don't kill a single man, woman, and child that's innocent. I'm not dropping bombs on you. I'm not using heavy, heavy guns on you. We're in cities. We drew them out and we killed them close quarter at speed on the highway. And we got out of our freaking taxi cab with the orange panels. Anybody in your audience that fought over there knows what I'm talking about. Orange panels on the front and the back. Got out and dead check and put two more on each one of their fucking heads. And then take their phones, take pictures of these fucking assholes and then do signals intelligence on whoever they're talking to with our fucking high-end people and the triple letter agencies, and then direct action, door kicking, uh, flashbangs, and then fucking executing bad guys and kidnapping bad guys. And we shut that fucking place down. And you know, looking back now, I don't know if I would do any of that anymore. Like I'd be scared, I think now. I'd be concerned and I'd talk a lot more. I'd say, all right, is this plan super sharp? <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. I think back to who I was then. I'm like, fuck, man, that was a bad motherfucker. Of course, there's a price to pay for being that guy. And thank God I lived because my community and my training was so hardcore and I was so violent. Violence does solve problems. That then through the off gas and the and, and the after effects that I have a beautiful country and beautiful people that actually care about me to help me through that for the last ten years. See when you're training Go to ahead. be a sniper, Rudy, why did they used to show you videos of people getting killed? Was that just to oh, toughen yeah, you up course. mentally? Yes. It, you, you, yes. And the data. Okay. When you're taking this fucking 762 round, it's 90 grain, depending on the grain, when it goes through glass and then hits the target's head, and the head expands three times its size and slams back into it. And then now look at the nervous system reaction to the body. The, the enemy had a weapon. Look at the nervous system. Let's look at circuitry shots. Let's look at pulmonary shots. All data. And if you ain't got the stones to do that, by the way, I didn't at the time when I saw that, I got not sick to my stomach, but I almost started to cry seeing a human being turn into meat like that because this is before I'd been to war. Later, I had no problems turning people into meat. If they're on the fucking list, they're fucking going down. I don't care if they're 12 years old. I don't care if it's a woman. I don't care if it's an old man. If they're on the list and they're doing what they're doing and they're on my list, I don't give a fuck if I'm putting them down. So see, when you came out of the Marines, is that when you really battled because you never had missions, structure? Like, was that when everything kind of came to a head? 
it was three or four years later because I was a workaholic brother as soon as I got out of the Marine Corps. I was the best coach, the best trainer. I was competing in jujitsu. I was kickboxing. Uh, and then next thing you know, HBO calls. And now I'm fucking training a whole $80 million production in fucking recon skills and infantry skills and running PT and running yoga and acting. And no, I worked, worked, worked. Three or four years later, when finally I slowed down. When are you at your happiest now, brother? When you're with your missus and the cat? Yes, I'm the happiest yoga. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this keep... is great too. <laughs> this is great too. My fucking my 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 fucking legend SAS stuff is fantastic because I am being utilized in such a way, and uh, and it's impacting the world. And it's it's impacting the world. It's impacting my life. I have a great living. I have my retirement and disability from the Marine Corps. I've got my pay for my my productions. My wife and I, Jade and I, will have a ranch with horses soon and a child soon. Um, however, this is the juice to get me back home. And what's so funny, just like in the unit, as soon as Billy and I are back home and Foxy are back home, we're just looking, how do we get back together? So Billy and I <laughs> spend time in Florida and, and in New York and we travel the world and we're, you know, we're going to go see the King of Jordan and, and spend time with him. And Foxy's coming on to force blue. Just like it's the best of everything. Now, now we do not have the, um, pathologies and the uh and the and, and the the anger we only have the love yet we can still be warriors we all know each other's wives and families billy knows my other recon brothers and my seal brothers um he was just at my brother's uh, my, my my uh my blood brother's um uh, birthday that we had in new york city and, Happy and he, birthday, he knows my family it's the best it's the best yeah. brother that's what it is. This is the best. I've never been better. Um, I have a little arthritis. I have, you know, you know, a little wear and tear. Yeah, but fuck, it was worth that's it. That's okay. It was so worth 50, it. Yeah, Fifty years old, like the life that like people now know your backstory, everything you've been through as a kid, to then having a big smile on your face. How did the celeb SES come about? Because Foxy, Billy, like they're two fucking legends in their own right. Like, how did the Americans get involved with the British one? Brother, it's because of that freaking. It's because of. Uh, once upon a time in Iraq. And you know what? I would only find out months later. I had no idea that Ant was being fired. I had no idea about any of the dramas of that. When they reached out to me on the strength of the BAFTA award-winning Once Upon a Time in Iraq, Minnow Film, says, I, Minnow Film said, I want Rudy Reyes. Um, I didn't know that Ant was being fired. Uh, I was a huge fan of the show. My missus and I were a huge, huge fan of the show. Of course, we always, uh, you know, actually, Billy is the fucking man now. He's really coming into his own. He's the funniest, smartest, sharpest guy in the world. We were huge Foxy fans, but we loved Ant, too. I loved Ant, too. I loved Ollie. I loved Billy. But Billy, Billy didn't, brother, Billy is the smartest, the funniest, the most, nobody's got more one-liners in the world than that man. And no one's got more combat experience in the world than that man. So, but Jade and I were always you guys, you know, but we loved the aunt too. <laughs> so, so uh, we loved them all. We loved them all. When they reached out to me during COVID, after I had my own show, canceled because no one in los angeles or america was working shut everything down i already had a show sold a, ra a rad fucking spiritual military mystery uh, uh um, a combat mindset fucking buddhist warrior show called haunted battlefields wow shut down no work knee surgery first time ever having a surgery uh, put on a little bit of weight because, you know, I'm a little older and, and I'm not running around and kickboxing all the time. Self-esteem down, everything going to the toilet. I'm in Idaho. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do for my fuck, rest of my fucking life. I don't know if I'm going to work again. This is like a year and a half ago. SAS calls. Um, I come out on the wreck with Billy. Best friends ever since. Billy is the older brother I've never had. I fucking love that man. Follow him. Uh, follow him to hell. Uh, 
immediately like fucking cheese and carrots. We are like uh, peas and carrots. We're together. It's fit. And, and, and we're talking to Foxy on video. Foxy comes in for the next recce. Now we can't be stopped. Um, I find out that uh, Ant is not coming back. And then I find out why. No big deal. We're going to drive on. But then I get the call that they would like me to be chief instructor. I said, what? I thought I was just the fucking, I thought I was the, the new guy. And I am the new guy. <laughs> so, I said, what? And so I called Billy and Foxy. Say, hey, brothers, this is what's going down. What do you think? Because I'm not going to do it if you guys are not down with it. I'm not doing this. With, I'm not going to disrespect your show. You all bu- built it to include Ant. You all built this show. And I'm not coming in to fucking, uh, I'm not coming in and fucking stealing anybody's thunder because I respect. And, and, and you know, it was Billy. Billy says, mate, you got the energy. You got the passion. You just what we need, mate. Come, bro. I said, fuck it. All right. So that's how it started. Yeah. How does it feel that Aunt Middleton's kind of firing shots at you? He's very immature. He's a very immature person. Um, and he, it's obvious how narcissistic he is. Um, and of course, you know what? If he was ever face to face with me, he wouldn't say a thing. He'd have no chance. Not against me. <laughs> believe that. <laughs> um, believe that. Um, I've always wished him the best. But I believe he's painted himself into a corner. He runs his mouth all the time, uh, and he doesn't. And he treats people poorly. That's all I have to say. Plans for the future, my brother. Like I say, this is one of the best. Co- I've done three hundred interviews, and this is one of the best conversations <laughs> I've had. Like you're a fucking nutcase, but there's such a good <laughs> vibe, mate. Yeah, yeah. Like you know this yourself, but there's such a fucking good vibe, mate. There's such. You've got, Thanks, brother. even though all the shit you've done in your life, even though the bad stuff that you've done, even your soul's still clean. Mentally, you're yeah, fucking brother. off your nut. My, part of me thinks you could be Scottish, <laughs> mate, in a previous I, life. I, I, maybe so. Maybe <laughs> so, brother. Maybe so. You know what? One day, we got to revisit this another time, and I'm going to bring a couple of my mates with me. Please do. That are fucking, that are crazier than me. Like, I'm the calm one. <laughs> <laughs> What's the plans for the future, my brother? Oh, brother, that's so much great thing. Well, Force Blue is doing very well. We will, we're at the Super Bowl again. We are the veterans nonprofit of the NFL and Pepsi. Uh, you know, saving uh, coral reefs and, and, and doing ocean conservation while saving one freaking veteran at a time. And when you save a veteran, or when you give a veteran purpose and a warrior purpose, uh, James, you're giving, you're saving whole families, because it's the families that struggle even more harder than us because they're in pain because of we're in pain, but they have no direct connection to change it. Only we can change it. So um, Force Blue is, is doing magnificent. And um, we're reaching out to Jason Momoa. And there's some talks about getting him together with Force Blue and doing a profound um you know, National Geographic or IMAX or Discovery Channel series in which we travel the world doing heavy duty. So why Force Blue is so powerful is that uh, us combat divers and and commandos can do ocean work that no one else can. We're physically stronger and have more experience to do things subsurface that other people can't, especially with high seas and such. Um, Momoa is a conservationist as well. So we're looking at doing more of that. I write, um, I write films and television. I I do some acting. I train uh, so that I have a long life, as long as I can, to have a child, Jade, and raise them for the first time. Be home to raise a child. Those are my goals, man, brother. You uh, tell your audience, yeah, you know, this is just the beginning, baby. I mean, there's a lot more to come. You know? <laughs> yeah, because Billy and uh, Foxy are two fucking legends, man. Like, you're you're in good ledge. company. And- even your, this conversation, this podcast will do really well is, and you'll get a lot of messages. So where can people contact you, brother? Brother, I guess I got, to, I got the website, rudyreyes.com. You can get on the link tree on the Instagram. You know, I, 
I've had like managers and agents in the past that just stole all my money. And I got Twitter way back. I never use it. I don't like talking on it because too many people talk with no accountability. But I have Instagram. I'm even locked out of my Facebook because I changed my phone number like three years ago or whatever. You know, if your work is uh, all, all your other brothers and sisters that are you looking at you, James, as a example, or even me too, about how to push forward your um, way of life and your uh, curiosity and goodness uh, to create platforms to bring people together. People that want to do YouTube, people that want to do uh, uh, social media in which to expand a platform so that they do things that are really good for them or the world. Anybody that wants to be a competitive athlete or an actor or wants to be a commando, um, distill your message to what's truly righteous in your heart. And so I just keep it simple. You can find me with my agency, which is, you know, APA. I've got a big Hollywood agent. You just Google my name. I love, how about this, James? <laughs> Rudy, Rudy Reyes. Rudy Reyes is a common Mexican name, brother. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a common Mexican name. Google Rudy Reyes and see who comes up. It's me. <laughs> Another <laughs> advice. Another advice to your audience. <laughs> it, it, take it from Rudy Reyes. Get to a level, no matter what your name is, that when they Google, you're the first fucking name up there. Yeah, that's when you know you've made it, brother. Oh, Force Blue, forcebluteam.org. For any veteran or family that is struggling, that wants to come go to work under the water and on the boat and get some health and happiness and help the planet, get on forcebluteam.org. You'll see it all on my link tree. It's easy to find. Rudy Reyes. Last question, ahead, brother. brother, or just last bit of advice for any. I know you've battled with mental health yourself. So, for anybody that's in the struggle right now, brother, what advice would you have for them? Best thing in the world that's ever happened for brothers and sisters in struggle is that we do have social media. Reach out. You're going to find so many people love you and want you to be here. Do not succumb to the sadness of the voice inside that you feel useless or no good reach out to one, reach out to five. You're going to find out they all love you and they're going to want you to stay here. That's it. Just want to say, fucking great soul, mate. Unbelievable interview today. You've done amazing. Proud of you. And when you're in the UK, man, let's catch up. And uh, I'll be coming I'll, out real happen. soon, brother. Yeah, but love you, brother. And thanks for your time. God bless you. And I always hear God if you bless need me, brother. brother. God bless you. You got bro. it. I'll be there. We'll do more in the future, brother. We'll do more Definitely. in the future. Thank you, brother. God bless. Love you, brother. Love you, brother. Cheers, bro.